Welcome to Insight Analog Photography Radio Program. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and of course, the Insight Analog Photography Radio Program is all about traditional process photography. We talk about instant photography. We talk about black and white. We talk about color film. We talk about dry plate, wet plate, you name it, alternate printing processes, everything going on in analog photography. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. They have beautiful C41 color neg, black and white, color chrome, and of course, instant. Instant film rocks. These guys have so much great things going on right now with instant film. Of course, they have the pack film in three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five. Color, black and white, high speed black and white, but you know what's even cooler? They have the Instex cameras and film. The Instex Wide is in the country, available everywhere. And of course, right now, brand new, the Instex Mini is now in the U.S. They have cameras. They have film. This Instex Mini is two and a half by three and a half. It's the size of a business card. This is really fun stuff. You got to check it out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab, the place to send all your film to get developed, proofs, you name it. They got a great workflow going. www.richardphotolab.com, DR5. For the most unbelievable proprietary process to turn your black and white film into positives, into chrome. You won't believe until you get your film back as a piece of chrome will blow your mind. The dynamic range, the latitude, it's just unbelievable stuff. Definitely check it out. www.dr5.com. Iger Studios. Lenny Iger, the place to have high-resolution scans done. You know, a lot of people now are shooting analog. They're using a high-resolution scan. They're making digital negatives on an inkjet. Or maybe they're going straight to an inkjet output. But they're making digital negatives and they're printing contact prints. They're doing all the stuff you need to get a high resolution scan. They're using an Aztec Premier, 8,000 PPI, adjustable aperture. They can give you scans that are basically grain free. They can adjust it for every kind of film out there. This is crazy stuff going on with Lindy Iger and the guys at Iger Studios. Check them out, igerstudios.com. And of course, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. The camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder. Our media partners www.apug.org, the Analog Photography User Group, the place on the web for all things analog process. This is a great place to learn, to share information, to get tips and tricks, the community for analog photography, www.apug.org, and of course, our photographic philanthropy partner, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, www.geh.org, the place to go to find out about the history of traditional analog photography. These people are keeping this alive. They have over 7,000 cameras in the museum of everything that's ever been made, including the Hasselblads that were shot on the moon. You name it. They have the collection. This is a great way to help support. You can be a member of George Eastman House organization. They have a lot of great things going on, but this is something you can do to help give back to photography, to help keep traditional analog photography alive for generations to come. Definitely check them out, www.geh.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo, Jose Villa. Jose is going to join us to talk about what he's got going on, what he's been doing, playing with some other non-traditional photographic process. He's been shooting more Holga. He's been shooting a lot of Fuji Instax. He's been shooting Polaroid SX-70. Pretty cool stuff going on with Jose, so we're going to chat with him today to see what he's up to, what's going on, his workshops, and all this great, beautiful photography that Jose's up to. Jose, how's it going today? Good, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to have you back on the program. I wanted to touch base today to see what you've been up to. I know that you've been doing a lot of new things in your fine art film-based wedding business. You're shooting kids, but you're doing a lot of what people would consider alternative process. I know you've been shooting some Fuji Instax, really digging some Polaroid stuff, and doing some alternative things. So I just wanted to have you on today to see what's up with Jose and how things are going in the fine art film wedding business. Yeah, well, thanks for having me back. I know I was on here about a year or a year and a half ago. So it's really good to be on here. Thanks for having me, Scott. I'm excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about what I'm up to. Things, of course, have changed a little bit for me. Of course, for the better, I'm always looking for inspiration. And as we all know, as wedding photographers, after the wedding season, sometimes we might feel a little burnt out. And thank goodness I haven't gotten to that extreme yet, but I've always caught myself by the end of the season And it's always great for me to pick up an Instax film camera or even a Polaroid or a Holga or a Roly. I mean, you name it. Definitely the alternative processes. That really helps me slow down. As a wedding photographer, gosh, we're shooting so many shots or images in a wedding. 
And we're shooting very fast. I mean, things are happening extremely fast at a wedding. Sometimes you can't insert yourself and say, okay, stop, redo. You kind of have to just go with the flow. And the great thing about picking up these alternative process cameras and stuff is that it allows me to think about my photo. It allows me to slow down and to really compose my shot. So that really brings me back to why I started photographing and how I'm very excited about photographing weddings and people and products or whatever it is that I'm doing. So, yeah, I started photographing with a Holga. Gosh, I mean, that was sort of the first camera that I started to play around with that wasn't your typical 35 millimeter or medium format fast camera. So I picked up that Holga and started shooting it in Mexico. I would just take these fun trips, and that was seven years ago. Then after that, I actually just started bringing it on to weddings and started to photograph these couples, one or two roles at a wedding, and people loved it. And then, of course, I loved it myself, so I just started to show it at my client potential meetings. And people started to say, I want that, I want that. And I started to include it a little bit more. Then I kind of put it down because, as you know, shooting these weddings, like I mentioned, it's very tough to kind of keep up sometimes. And you want to get your safe shots first because, of course, that's what they hired you for. But you also want to maybe pick up your Polaroid camera or your SX-70 or your Instax or your Holga. But sometimes those cameras are a little slow. So I've been incorporating a lot of that these days. Let's chat about the Holga piece itself. So, of course, everybody knows the Holga is a very inexpensively priced plastic camera with a little plastic lens. <laughs> Why do you find that your clients actually look through your book and say, I want some images like that? Why do you think that people are drawn to the Holga look? What's your thoughts on why people want you yeah. to make sure, you know, at least try to grab a few of these during the wedding? Yeah. Well, the reaction that I get when I show these images, people say, wow, well, that really stands out. Or this looks like a vintage photo that was taken, who knows, 40, 50 years ago. Or this looks like an image that my grandpa took in the late 50s or whatever it was. And it sort of reminds them of maybe some of their family photo albums back when their grandparents were photographing them or their parents as kids or whatever it was. And then also, it's a very artistic camera. I mean, it's okay that it's out of focus. It's okay that there's a little bit of blur. They love the vignette. It's all natural vignette without having to do anything in the computer. A lot of these images that I'm showing are hand-printed Holga images. And people look at that and go, wow, we love this look. So, yes, we want to make sure that we get the contacts because that's what I'm shooting with my medium format or the crisp, clear 35 millimeter 85 1.2 shots with shallow dope to field. Of course, we want to get those shots, but why not incorporate some fun Holga shots where there's a little bit of blur and there's a little bit of that motion and vignette and all that? Why not? It's beautiful. So those clients that respond to that very much love photography or maybe they're photographers themselves or maybe they're an art director or someone who knows photography and love it. So if I can show that to my potential clients and they fall in love with it, I know I have a perfect client sitting right in front of me. And I push even harder to be able to satisfy them and to keep them as happy clients. So if I show them my SX-70, they're going to grin and they're going to go, oh my God, of course, bring it to the wedding. And that's the type of client that keeps me inspired. I love that. I mean, not all my clients need to be that way. Of course, I have clients that don't love the look of Holga. I have some clients that say, what is that? And that's okay, too. I'm totally fine. I love challenges. And shooting with a very low plastic camera at a very fast-paced wedding is a challenge. Not everybody can do it. But for me, I love it, and I'm always up for challenges, and, of course, for beautiful images as well. So with the Holga, and you had mentioned that a lot of people like to have these one-off hand-printed items. Are you actually doing some of these prints that are actually optically enlarged from this color film you're shooting via the Holga? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we sent them to Richard Photo Lab, which is my lab that I use in Los Angeles, and we have them printed down there. We have somebody printing them in the darkroom. And for 35 millimeter and medium format stuff, we're sending them to Robert Cavalli down there in Los Angeles as well, who's a master printer. He does pretty much all our hand printing in those mediums. So let's talk about this. There's this big buzz about the hybrid workflow. And I think really, unless you were doing one-off, hand-done, black-and-white weddings, there's no way that you could do 600-plus images delivered to a client and all optically enlarged and printed with proofs. So what have you found via your work? And let's specifically touch off on Richard because you use Richard Photo Labs. I know that you're using the SP2500 Fuji scanner. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. So what do you find that the prints that you have made via the digital file that's scanned with the Fuji scanner with the Fuji film versus Mm -hmm. something that's shot on Fuji film but optically enlarged where the light has been pushed through the negative to make a print? Well, I've been, what you've basically said about scanning them onto the Fuji scanner there, but we've also been printing most of my proofs on the Fuji Frontier. 
And that Fuji Frontier is, I don't know, 20, 30 years old. I don't know exactly how many years, but it's so beautiful for color photography. Now, in black and white, I got to say, sometimes they're a little green. They shift a little magenta, and mostly it's because they're not being printed optically, of course, because that would be so expensive, number one, and it would be so time-consuming. That's something that definitely we would like to explore maybe in the future if once I'm shooting less weddings. But right now, as I'm shooting 45 weddings a year or 40 weddings a year, whatever it is, that's really tough. It's really tough to get all of those hand-printed in the darkroom. But, I mean, you got to admit, I mean, there's nothing like a hand-printed black and white image in the darkroom. I mean, it's unbelievable, especially because when you're dodging and printing and maybe sepia toning, I mean, they're all so different. It's a one-of-a-kind piece. But anyway, going back to that Fuji Frontier, I love the color images that come off of that Frontier. So there's really no point for me, at least right now, to be printing that stuff optically in the darkroom just because it's really so beautiful on the Frontier printer, and it makes it less expensive and also a lot less time, too, for the people over there at Richard Photo Lab. Sure, I guess if there's a one-off portrait or if someone picks one image from a wedding or a bridal shoot or an engagement shoot, then yes, you could have one done optically if they really wanted it. Oh, Thanks. absolutely. We offer that in the packaging, too, is that if, for example, if bride and groom wants to book me for my seven-hour wedding packet, which I usually call them plans, but if they hire me for plan two, in that plan, there's going to be four 11 by 14s that they get in that plan. Basically, once they get their images, they're going to select their favorite four, and those are going to go directly to the darkroom, whether it be color, whether it be black and white. But when they get their 600 four by 6 proofs, those are going to be printed off of that Fuji Frontier printer. So have you had people, Jose, actually request, hey, will you shoot my wedding completely in black and white? I want it all silver gelatin. I want everything yeah. black and white. Funny you say that. Yes, actually, I had a client about maybe, when was that, three years ago, who said, we're really big on black and white. We want everything printed in the dark room. What would it cost, and would you do this? And I said, to be quite honest with you, I'm actually pretty nervous to photograph just strictly black and white photos of your wedding because I'm really big on color. I love color photography, and I love using that Fuji Pro H stuff. It's amazing, and I love overexposing that and backlighting it and all that good stuff. And so I agreed to do the wedding all in black and white, but I brought along, I don't know how many rolls, must have been maybe seven or eight rolls of 220 color stuff, and I shot it at the wedding and shot it with my contacts. I just did it as an extra. I mean, I handed it off to my assistant, or I would hold it and take some shots too with it. And my client was so happy that I shot color because it was a beautiful day. I mean, the colors were amazing. Her flowers were beautiful. I think she was just going into it as I love photojournalism and I love that kind of black and white strict photography. But she didn't really realize how beautiful color would be for her wedding. And she ended up thanking me for it. So like I said, I do take on challenges and I love challenges. And in this case, this was a challenge because I love black and white, but I don't feel like I'm a very strong black and white photographer. I do feel, though, that I'm a very strong color photographer, and that's the type of clients mostly I'm attracting these days, these brides and grooms that love color, and they look at my images from looking at so many other websites, most of them probably digital photographers, and they go, wow, we stopped on your website. How do you get this color? This is totally different than what we've seen, and then tell them, hey, well, actually, I shoot film, and they go, oh, my gosh, okay, cool. Well, we thought it was film or whatever it was. And in the end, it's not about whether I shoot film or digital. It's just about the look that they're looking for. And it happened that they just love the look of film. Let's talk about that. Do you find that because you shoot mainly in color, and I find this personally myself, that I don't see in black and white. I can shoot T-Max or Fuji black and white and develop it correctly. I can get 16 stops in one image, and it's unbelievable. But you know something? I just haven't been able to really grasp the whole black and white deal. I don't see in black and white. I find that I have to shoot color because that's what's there. I definitely think that there are some very, very strong black and white photographers that they know the lighting. They know what a good black and white image is going to look like once they're shooting it. When I'm shooting a wedding, I have three cameras on me. I have my two 35mm Canon 1Vs, and then I have a contact in my hand, and then we have some backup in the car just in case kind of stuff. But that's what we're bringing on location to these weddings. Now, at all times, one of my 35 millimeters has black and white in it, and the other one has color. And most of the day, most of the cases for these weddings, I have color that's in my contacts. So even though I'm really attracted to color, there's definitely situations when I got myself or I look at the situation, I go, this is definitely a black and white photo. And those cases may be, for example, portraits of the bride and groom by a window. Just using window light, not necessarily showing the window. I'm not saying those cheesy photos by window. I'm saying just using the light as the soft light that's coming through 
and just having these great one to two, three ratio type of lighting situations on the sprite. That's when I feel that in this case, it would be a great black and white photo. Or them coming down the aisle in a very contrasty situation, they're happy, they're cheering, there's petals being thrown in their faces, and I'm shooting wide angle as they're walking down the aisle. Those are some of my favorite black and white images. Now, if the sun's going down and we're doing sunset photos, as we all know, we're so spoiled here in California, the lighting is freaking beautiful 360 days out of the year. And as the sun's going down, because that's my favorite light, you get these beautiful, warm tones, and the sky's turning this beautiful magenta, purple, greenish look kind of color. Thinking, well, why am I going to be shooting black and white right now when the color is insanely, amazingly warm? Now, like I mentioned, there's definitely situations where black and white is more appropriate. And I do see that. I do sense that. I look at the light, I look at the ratios, and I feel like right now, right here, I need to be doing black and white. And I'm prepared for that the whole day. But color is definitely my main shooting film throughout the day. No, I think that's an interesting thought. It's just a lot of people anymore, especially people shooting digital, is they're like, oh, I'll just convert it in Photoshop. Well, it's not the same. It doesn't look the no, same. It's different. Right. right. And one thing, too, that I want to mention is that I do shoot 100% film. And then we have Richard Photo Lab scanning my film, and then we provide a DVD of all the high-resolution files to my clients. And it's so awesome for me because I'm able to, of course, put on my blog or do magazine album design on Photoshop. Now, we don't mess with any of the files unless we absolutely have to. In most cases, 95% of the time, Richard Photo Lab has already done the beautiful color adjusting on the files that have been scanned from their lab. The only thing that slows us down is that sometimes there's a little bit of dust on these negatives. And that's just the nature of having your stuff being scanned in a very busy place. There's going to be dust that's going to be attracted onto that negative, and of course, you're going to have those white spots. But that's easy enough to go in there and just clean it up, literally take five seconds or less. That's when we're doing this. But in most cases, it's pretty spot-free. The great thing, too, is that these brides and grooms are asking for digital files because that is what most people are offering these days in the wedding industry. And it's, of course, great for them to archive their images and technology, how it's advancing and all this good stuff. The great thing about me offering now a DVD is that is such a big way for me to make more income. Now what I do is I offer this DVD, and I offer it as an a la carte product. So my packaging might start at X amount of dollars, but if they want to add a DVD, that's going to be an extra X amount of dollars. Now their package is not at, let's say, 5000 Now it's at 7000 because they added the DVD, for example. But the great thing of everything being so digital these days is that I've actually increased my income because of it. And it's the best thing that's ever happened to my business. I think people want these files and you can make more dough and you still have the look of film. There's no reason why not to offer a digital file because you have captured it on film. It has the film look, it has the color, it has the contrast, it has whatever you want it to be. And at least using the high-end scanner, the SP2500, or even an Imicon or a drum scan is going to be able to capture what you shot on films. So there's no reason not to offer these files and make more dough. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, a lot of people that are very hardcore film shooters and are just true to the complete analog process tend to shun off this hybrid workflow. And I think that if film's going to survive and it's going to grow, people need to actually embrace doing this hybrid workflow shoot on film and output via digitally or however your customer wants because basically the bottom line is the person that's paying the bill should get what they want yeah no exactly as you were just talking i was thinking to myself what if i didn't offer a dvd or what if there was no way of scanning film and i'm thinking that i'm going man that would really affect my business and really that's because the only reason they would see my images is if they came into my studio and if they actually saw the images in my book or whatever it was, versus, of course, having a digital image and putting them on my blog or my website. So it's a good thing to definitely have stuff scanned. Financially, definitely is a bonus. And then I'm able to, of course, share my images so much more, too, by submitting it to magazines and by submitting to these huge wedding blogs that now I get so much of my business off of. So I definitely credit having these images scanned onto DVD and having the ability to do that to growing my business. Jose, I think we've gone over this before with some other chats we've had, but let's sort of talk about your actual choice in analog capture. I know you're a Fuji guy, so let me talk about what you like to shoot. And we're going to get into some of this alternate materials, instant film and so forth, but let's talk about your traditional capture and what you're digging these days. Sure. Well, I mentioned a little bit about the color film that I use, but my favorite color film to use is the Fuji Pro 400H. 
and I shoot that on 220 with my Contact 645, which is one of my main cameras. I definitely shoot about 75% of the wedding with the contacts. I just have the 80 millimeter on there, f2.0, always. I don't care if it's bright, 1 p.m., I'm still shooting that thing at 2.0. Now, I'm also loving the 800, it's a good film as well. Not my favorite, but I definitely like to use it. And then I'm using the black and white Fuji films, which is the 400 Neopan and the 1600 Neopan. And that 1600 Neopan, man, I love that stuff. That stuff is absolutely amazing. I love the contrast on it. I love the grain on it. Beautiful. I also shoot some 3200 Kodak stuff, and I'm mostly using that because I might need a little bit more speed in low light situations. So that's mostly why I'm photographing with it. Of course, I love the grain, but I'm not necessarily photographing it because I love the grain. I'm photographing it because I need a little bit more of that speed to help me out here in certain situations. But those are my main films. I would definitely tell you that I'm shooting definitely a lot more 400 Pro H color stuff and the 400 Neopan throughout the day. The other stuff I'm photographing in lower light situations. That stuff, like I said, is mostly just to help me out with that speed. So those are my main films. I shoot Canon 1V. That's my 35 millimeter. And I have an 85 1.2. I have a 50 1.2. And then I macro 100 2.8 and a 70 to 200 2.8. Those are my four lenses that I bring on location, but I don't even use that 100 macro anymore. seems like I'm just lugging it around, taking it on trips. But those are my main lenses with that Canon. So really with the Canon, it's two bodies, one with a 50, one with the 85? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the yep. time? Most of the time, yep. It depends on the situation. During the ceremony, I'm going to bring out that 70 to 200 because I don't want to be obtrusive. I don't like getting close. I don't want anybody to see me, and I don't want anybody to turn around and make faces at me because I'm right next to them, blocking their view. So I'm definitely aware of my surroundings as I'm photographing, for sure. And everything that you try also is wide open on the 35. Absolutely, yeah. I love the 1.2. That look is pretty amazing. Very cool. So one thing that you had mentioned earlier that I want to touch base off on is you specifically don't advertise. And if you look at your blog and your website that, hi, I'm Jose, I'm the film guy. Mm -hmm. You just say, mm -hmm. I'm so-and-so, and this is what I do. And I don't think it even <laughs> lists anywhere that you shoot film. Oh, uh, so funny you say that, because that is actually 100% true. I don't post anywhere on my blog or website. I take that back. Maybe one or two posts I might have said something on my blog, but it's not like in my bio section I say, hello, I live in Solving and I shoot film. No, that's not my main focus. For me, my mentality is if you love my work, it doesn't matter what I shoot. But what's happening over the last couple of years is so many vendors, wedding planners, photographers, of course, have known that I shoot film. And they're coming to me because I shoot film. So it's not a big deal for me to put on there that I'm a strictly 100% film shooter. It's not anything that I'm really going after. Because to be quite honest with you, out of the 45 weddings I shot in 2009, maybe one person said, hey, do you shoot digital? Seriously, it's mostly because my work is coming through word of mouth. And that's how I want it to be. I want it to be because I shot the bride's sister or one of the bridesmaids or somebody in the industry and they already know that I'm shooting film. That's the type of client I'm shooting for. I think in 2009 here, you shot, what, 8, 10, 12 wedding plus that were actually weddings of wedding photographers. Yeah, absolutely. And one of them is digital photographer Jessica Clare. I only mention her name because so many photographers know of her as a wedding photographer that loves digital, and her color in digital is really nice. And a lot of people tend to gravitate towards that that are doing digital these days. But it's interesting to me that these 10 or so photographers hired me in 2009 to photograph their wedding. Now, they're wedding photographers that shoot digital. And when I asked most of them, hey, why did you choose me as a film shooter to photograph your wedding? And they said, well, we want something different. We also love the look of film. It's so beautiful. It's so classic and organic. And we love the look of it. And I asked them, well, why don't you shoot film then if you love film so much? And they say, oh, well, it's because it's a business thing. We shoot digital because it's business, business, business. And it just sort of breaks my heart. It's like, ah, I can't believe that somebody would just forget about the art of photography. And not that digital is not. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some great photographers out there that do some amazing stuff with digital. But in this situation, they love film so much that they're having a film shooter shoot their wedding. Like, this is their wedding. Like, this is their biggest moment in their life. And they have chosen to do a film shooter. And in most cases, it has been because they want to save money or they think they can save money or it's a big business decision. My mentality is, look, I'm going to put my photography first. And I'm going to think about the art first. And then let the business follow. 
I'm not saying that film shooters don't make a good income. Of course we all do. We all know that we have high film lab bills. But those digital shooters are spending hundreds of hours in front of a computer that I don't want to do because I want to shoot more. Film allows me to shoot more. Film allows me to promote myself more and to work on the art of photography more than to be in a computer adjusting my digital files to make them look like film. Or more so over-processing your digital files to make them look horrible. That too, yeah, depending on the way you want to process your stuff, absolutely. But I can tell you most of my digital wedding photographer friends are always asking me, how do you make your files? Or not asking me, but they're just sort of complaining at the fact that their digital files never look like film. And I'm like, hello, why don't you just shoot it? And they're always, it's expensive, it's expensive, it's expensive. Well, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, you shoot one wedding, it's going to maybe take you 30, 40 hours to edit and do your whole workflow on this digital wedding. Okay, what's more important now? Is it the time or is it the amount of money? So really, you kind of have to think about that. And also, they're going to buy new equipment in the next 12, 18 months because there's new digital cameras, as we know, every six months, it seems like. So they're going to go out and get the newest, greatest thing. And I mean, how much money are they spending a year on equipment? Probably definitely more than fifteen, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. So really, it's not about the money, I think, in the end. Or maybe to them it is, but to me it's really not even about that. It's about just freeing up your time and being able to be as creative as possible with fun alternative processes like SX-70 or Holga or Rolly cameras or Leicas or whatever it is that you love to shoot with. Well, I mean, look at these people. They go out and spend, like you said, five, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on a body. They buy it every 18 months. And then mm-hmm. they go out and shoot five or 6,000 images because I guess they figure... Wow, it's digital, it's free. Let's just turn it on burst and just let it roll. Might as well just go get myself a video camera and shoot it. I honestly remember shooting gigs with a blad and you got two rolls to go shoot that wedding with. Here you go. Good luck. Yeah. Really, I mean, a lot of people used to do that or if you worked for a studio, the boss man would send you out. Ultra cheap, dude. Here, two rolls. Come back yeah. with some extra. That's crazy. And yeah. you had to do no, that. And really, yeah. you don't need to shoot 5,000. There's no reason to shoot five or 6,000 images. I can't even conceive that. That and then also your client is not looking for 5,000 photos. So your client is looking for the final 600 to 700. Even that is a lot. But your client really is looking for their favorite 10 to 15 smashing photos that definitely they have now for the rest of their lives. They're going to pass down to their grandchildren and all that good stuff. What are they going to do with 1,500 photos, 2,000 photos? Nothing. They're going to be stored in a closet somewhere. So I'm not saying taking a lot of photos is a bad thing. I'm just saying that sometimes thinking about your photo is a lot more impactful than just snapping away just because you're shooting digital and you can delete, 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 delete. With film, we can't do that. With film, it's like click $1, click $2, click $3. So we're definitely thinking more about our shots. We're slowing down instead of just click, click, click. Now, recently I had a photographer friend of mine who is a pretty big digital shooter up there in San Francisco. And I said, I'm going to challenge you. I want you to take a film camera on location. And for part of the ceremony, I just want you to shoot film. Just shoot film. And he shot film, absolutely loved it, came back and said, oh, my God, I can't believe how great it was to shoot film and how it was so refreshing for me to slow down and to think about my shots because I gave him my contacts. I said, here's the contacts, you shoot it, and we'll send it to Richard Photo Lab. What ended up happening is in 2010, he's switching 100% to film because he loved how his images came out. He composed the shots. He thought about the shots. And in the end, they turned out so much better than his digital files, mostly because he was already on this, I'm going to take a thousand photos for the ceremony, let alone a couple other thousand for the rest of the event. So it's interesting. It's interesting to me kind of even in general where film is going. I think that film is sort of having a comeback, if you want to call it that, in this industry, where so many digital photographers that never even shot film ever, their first camera they picked up was a digital camera, are now getting into shooting film. Why? Because that's the new thing to do these days in this digital world. So it's really interesting to me that that's what they're doing. I know more than a few photographers that have come to my workshops that were 100% digital. They left the workshop. I let them borrow my camera or cameras that we have on location for shooting, and we gave them some film that Fuji sponsored, sent them to Richard Photo Lab. They fell in love, and now they're shooting mostly 100% film for their weddings. And they're thanking me for it, and they're going, thank you so much. I'm saving so much time, and I love the outcome of these images. 
It's great. It's rewarding for me that someone has fallen in love with shooting with film after just really knowing everything about photography only through a digital camera. So, Jose, let's talk about these different processes that you're doing now at the wedding. Of course, I know we were shooting all the great Canon and contact stuff, making sure we're getting our shots. But let's talk about the instant stuff. You're shooting, of course, with the Fuji Instax. It's quite cool. they got both mm-hmm. sizes are available in the country now and the regular wide format and the mini. But also, I know that you've been digging traditional, old-school SX-70 Polaroid. Yeah, I've really been digging that lately. And I've never actually shot that before, probably until three or four months ago when I really got into it. And it was really big in our school when actually the Polaroid SX-70 was still, of course, producing it. Now I'm getting it through Polar Premium and shooting the artistic TZ stuff, I guess it's called, and I'm loving it. It's definitely a little bit of a challenge. It's definitely expensive. I'm not going to say it's cheap. It's eight photos for $22, I think it is. You really have to think about your shot because, I mean, there goes three, four dollars every time you click on that. But when you do get it, you get it right, and it's beautiful. Now, I have taken it on weddings, but I will tell you that my favorite shots have come through photographing landscapes and have come through photographing just on fun, inspirational shoots in Mexico or Italy. Recently, we were over there, and I went all out on that stuff. I was digging it. It was awesome. Pretty amazing. But I do love that that little mini Instax that you mentioned. Beautiful stuff. And so many people at the weddings that I've been taking it at, a lot of guests look at that and go, what in the heck is that? Because it's kind of a funky-looking camera, and my clients are digging it as well. So it's a great camera. I love it. I'm really digging it right now. No, people love instant photography, and you can pull out and you shoot something, and that's it. One off. It's real. It's a piece of art. That's all there is. Exactly. But I'm also loving my Roly, and I take along my baby Roly onto locations as well. I put about a year ago a nice little M7 Leica, and I've been playing around with that as well. So I do have to be careful, though, because all these alternative processes I take onto these weddings, I get really confused because there's so many amazing things that I want to do with all of them. So I have to limit myself. I have to take one little toy every time I go out to these weddings. And whether it's a Holga or my SX-70 or my Instax or my Roly, I only take one. Because if I take them all or even two, I'll get way too confused because I want to play with all of them. And I don't have the time. Sometimes, as we all know, shooting weddings, we only have five minutes sometimes to photograph the bride and groom at sunset. So in that situation, I'm only able to really get my safe shots and get the contact 645 out and the 35 millimeter color stuff. That's the thing. If you have two 1Vs hanging off each shoulder and you're shooting the 645 in your hand and you've got someone feeding you backs, it's difficult to grab a good old plastic camera and squeeze off a few in between. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because you've got to wind all these and it's like crank, crank, crank. <laughs> So, Jose, tell me about some process, some type of photography that you want to do that you haven't done yet. Is there anything you're looking forward? What's your thought behind yeah. doing maybe large format portraiture? I don't know. Is there anything that yeah. you want to do that you haven't got a chance to really play with yet? Yeah, well, I've played with so much going through school, and I remember taking a photography class called Beyond Portraiture, and that class really introduced us to some pretty amazing stuff from large format 8x10 to even some crazy large format 20x24 Polaroid, if you can imagine. They had one of those at school, and we were allowed to shoot one of them every session. I don't know how much these Polaroids would cost for that big of a camera, but I'm sure they were probably hundreds. I really love Polaroid transfers. I don't know if you've done Polaroid transfers, but, man, I'm digging that stuff, and I really want to try to potentially bring some of this stuff to weddings. But right now, I really have to find the right client for me to do that at because that stuff is definitely a little bit more time-consuming. So I really want to play around with that stuff. Right now, I'm just doing my own little personal stuff with it when I'm still trying to nail it because it takes a little bit of practice. But I want to try to explore some of that with some of my portraiture or some of my wedding stuff. So that's kind of what I'm working on a little bit. But to be honest, there's so many things. I mean, there's cyanotypes. There's so many different things that I want to do. But gosh, if only the days were longer. So true. Now let's talk about what you've been doing here with your engagement portraiture work. I think you've been working on a few things that are a bit different than you've traditionally been doing. So let's talk about what you're up to here in engagement land. Yeah, and to be quite honest with you, I've never really loved photographing engagement sessions up until probably about a year ago. Engagement sessions have been a little bit of a challenge just because sometimes it's hard for me to break the shell and the love really and the communication between these two people that are standing in front of me. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but I've really loved getting into them lately because we are now incorporating more of a stylized type of a shoot where a stylist is on location and a makeup artist and all that good stuff. It basically becomes more of a lifestyle type of a photo shoot. 
And I've always loved fashion magazines. I've always loved you know, Harper's Bazaar magazine and W and all these great magazines. And I noticed that so many of my clients love that editorial lifestyle kind of look in these magazines. So because I love it and it's definitely just an extension of really who I am and what I love to do, I just thought, hey, why not? Why not start doing this? So we started doing it about a year ago. And I've noticed the trend is definitely bigger these days, but we take a lot more time to make sure that the client is getting everything that they want. We ask them questions about maybe the different backgrounds that they're looking for, what they're into, maybe where they met, all that good stuff. And then we also ask them maybe what are their favorite clothing that they want to wear, and we get a stylist on it. The stylist picks out their clothing, brings it on location, and we basically make it a nice fashion editorial shoot. And they're loving it. Now, of course, we're not going crazy over the top where now we're photographing them and that's really not who the client is. We have to make sure that this is really who they are and we're not putting them in crazy costumes or anything like that. It's definitely natural. It's definitely who they are. And it's definitely very fun and playful. And in the end, they end up loving those a lot more than just, let's say, hey, I'll show up at your house and then you follow me to a great open field and then we start shooting. There's a little bit more thought that goes around it and people are loving that a lot more these days. So it's definitely market now that I've started featuring that on my blog. And I get people that call me that say, hey, look, we've already found a wedding photographer, but we love your engagement session so much that we want to just do an engagement session with you. And in that case, I'll say, sure, absolutely. Let's do this engagement session. Or somebody will say, you're maybe not in our price range. We found somebody else to do our wedding, but we still want a little bit of your work. So we want to do an engagement session and we love what you're doing with these lifestyle editorial type of shoots. And I'm digging those because it's cool to work with a group of people, like a stylist and a makeup artist and stuff like that. So are you shooting these more fashion type look to where you're using maybe a lot of artificial light on set or just still all natural light? No, not big on that artificial light. I mean, seriously, I just do everything natural light, backlight, flare, exposing to the shadow type of stuff. And really, I'm just basically shooting the way that I normally shoot because that's the look that I love. But now we're just making it a little bit more editorial. We're documenting a little bit more part of their lives. Maybe they want me to photograph them in their home and they're just hanging out on the couch leaning into each other. Maybe they're having a cup of coffee or maybe they are taking a bike ride down the beach or whatever it is, but I'm documenting that. Or maybe they're flying a kite because that's what they love to do and I'm documenting that. Now I'm not only just documenting them as a nice portrait shot, I'm now incorporating a little bit more of their lifestyle into this shoot and we customize it for everyone because everyone has different likes and different hobbies and you name it. And it's a little bit more meaningful than just show up at my house and let's do some stuff in this open field kind of stuff. Very, very cool to see your expansion on that and just other things you're doing. Think too that even in the sense of marketing and business moving forward here in 2010, that your involvement with these ancillary blogs, not so much your own, but even other people's blogs, submitting images to the way that brides are connecting with photographers. I think it's great to be able to do all the stuff with magazines and submit your images and build relationships with editors and photo editors and so forth. But I think another thing you're doing that's really cool is just the expansion of the online community and be able to reach out and touch people quicker and sooner with these other blogs. Yeah, these blogs are so big these days for these wedding vendors and even for a lot of these brides and grooms as well, but mostly brides. I mean, let's just be fair here. A lot of these brides are online looking at some inspirational boards or even some inspiration from other weddings that they've seen on, like, for example, Style Me Pretty. Style Me Pretty gets 2 million hits a month. I would say probably half of those hits are coming from brides that are looking for either vendors or they're looking for inspiration for their own wedding. So what I'm doing is I'm targeting these blogs and I'm saying, hey, I have these great weddings that you might want to feature on your blog. And what's happening is I'm getting a lot of inquiries. I'm getting a lot of weddings off of these online blogs versus now getting a lot of my inquiries through magazines. Now, I love magazines. Magazines are definitely my first choice when I submit my images. But with these blogs, they've blown up. They've been a really, really big hit. And I now focus on those. There's others, for example, like OnceWed.com. There's SnippetAndInk.com. There's a few others that are definitely leading the way. And now what's happened is now they're asking me for photos. These blog owners are saying, hey, we need this image. We need this type of wedding. We need this indoor, outdoor, vineyard, barn, whatever it is. And I say, yep, I have it. Here you go. I hand it over to them, and my name is just constantly being spread around the Internet because what's happened is so many other vendors are going on there too, like wedding planners and florists and bakers and venues. They're going on there taking a look at what is out there in the industry, and they want to look for inspiration as well. So they're looking on these blogs, getting that inspiration and my name is actually getting out there a lot more. 
And I know a lot of photographers do that these days, and it's a great thing to do. We all know that advertising in a magazine can lead to thousands and thousands of dollars worth of advertising. But who has that money to do that kind of stuff? Or even if you do, how much really do you get from it? You have to ask yourself that. And for me, I've learned business through doing this myself. I mean, I didn't learn this in school. They didn't really have a business class in school. They had one, but it was like, whatever. It wasn't a big deal. And I learned so much by saying, okay, well, let me throw $2,000 at this full page ad and see what happens. Well, my phone wasn't ringing. But then as soon as I started to submit my weddings to magazines, the phone started ringing. And people started saying, oh my gosh, I saw your wedding here. I saw your wedding there. I love this color. I love this. Where was this wedding? And then as these blogs started taking over the internet, I started submitting to blogs and pretty soon the inquiries kept coming. And I can tell you in 2010, probably 25% of my weddings are from wedding blogs. And I couldn't tell you that last year. Last year, I would have told you, what are you talking about? Blogs? What blogs? But as we all know, things change so fast and you kind of have to sort of go along with what's happening with the change. You don't want to be left behind. And taking an hour out of your day, or possibly two, to select your favorite 60 photos to send to these blogs is a huge deal. It's huge. It's definitely big and it's going to reward you so much more than spending your own money on seeing if the phone will ring in advertising a full page. So definitely trends, social networking, Twitter, Facebook, all this stuff. I always thought that was all a joke, but it's not a joke. But I don't target my clients through Twitter or Facebook. It's not that. It's just that I'm sharing pieces of what I'm doing in my photography that inspire those people that are potentially looking at hiring me. And like I mentioned, I shot 10 weddings for wedding photographers in 2009. I'm shooting probably that and a little bit more in 2010 mostly because these are wedding photographers that maybe know of me in the industry or on Facebook or Twitter, and they're inspired by any shoot that I'm Twittering or whatever it is. Sounds funny, but it's true. It's really interesting how this whole industry and Internet has changed so fast over the last even year. I mean, who knew of Twitter a year and a half ago? So here's a question. You're shooting these weddings for wedding photographers, and I'm sure all of them are shooting digital. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that Jose makes beautiful images. You have the eye. You know what you're looking for. Let's stand back and say how much of what these other wedding photographers want their images shot. I know it's Jose, but what if Jose was shooting digital? Would they want you to shoot their wedding too? Or would they just pick some Joe out of whoever one of their buddies to shoot it? Right. No, I think it's a combination of both. I think that these digital photographers first love the look of film, and second, they love my eyes. They love maybe the simplicity. They love how I see stuff. For example, and I keep referring back to Jessica's wedding, but Jessica wanted a lot of details for her wedding, and she knows that I'm good at details, and I photograph those things very well. She had so many details at her wedding that it was so even hard to point out and to even capture every single detail at her wedding. It was pretty insane. You think about the deals like her, okay? So let's use Jessica as an example, okay? Why didn't she have Becker shoot it? Why didn't she have Mike Cologne shoot it? Why didn't she have one of her other buddies shoot it? And of course, I mean, you do such a great job of this stuff, but I just come yeah. to think that why these people are such hypocritic about film, nobody can replace Jose and the images are just incredible and your art is beautiful. But I still think yeah. to a point that somehow deep down, these people that jumped on the film bandwagon, I don't know how to phrase this. It's just really amazing to me that these people that are so pro digital and everything is so post process and all this, and they have someone do traditional, real, beautiful photography. It's great. I think it's great. I love it, but it's still yeah. amazing. At the other point, it just blows yeah. me away, like, wow. To be fair, I mean, I'm sure she knows a lot of great photographers that do digital, but also some of these great photographers are her friend, or they've known each other for many years or whatever it is, so she wanted them to be at her wedding. So I think a good combination of reasons why she possibly or probably selected me as her photographer. And I thought about it for a while because I'm thinking, gosh, she must know at least 100 photographers that she loves and possibly likes her work. Why is she choosing me to photograph her wedding? So I asked myself that same question, and I think, like I mentioned, it's definitely a combination of a bunch of stuff. Yes, she loves film. She wanted something a little different than what she normally shoots. Yes, she possibly loves the way that I photograph in natural light, and I photograph mostly vineyard weddings, and it was definitely the type of wedding that I would love and I'd be really into, and I'm good at shooting. And then also possibly that these photographers are her friend, and she wanted them to be at her wedding. I can't sit here and say she was my best friend and I wasn't invited to the wedding, but we've definitely become friends after photographing her wedding, and I can say that for sure. Now, if she was getting married in two years, maybe she wouldn't have had me shoot her wedding because maybe now she wanted me to enjoy her wedding. So it's a little interesting to me why, but nonetheless, it was great. It was a great experience. I felt it was definitely a challenge. 
when you're photographing another photographer's wedding, no pressure, right? But it's a good challenge, and I grow from those challenges. As you well know, I mean, there was maybe 60 people, let's say, for example, at her wedding, and probably about 40 of them were photographers. And these are photographers that we all have heard of, like Becker and all these other people. And they were there sort of looking and watching at what I was doing or glancing over because they were curious. Of course, I would do the same thing if I was at a wedding just to see what the photographer was shooting or how they were directing. So definitely I felt like there was a million eyes focused on me, but in the <laughs> end, it was great. You know what they probably were doing, though? They were just so amazed that you weren't chimping at the back of your camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, it was a good experience overall. I will say that I don't do very good under crazy amounts of pressure where there's 40 photographers looking at me. But overall, I felt like I did a great job. We got it on a couple of blogs, got a couple of inquiries through the whole thing. I became friends with Jessica. Oh, My, it's great. It's beautiful. You know, way of shooting. It was all super, super good. And that was just one out of nine of the weddings that I shot for photographers last year. So it's awesome. I really do value those challenges, and I welcome them because it makes me a better person and a better photographer. No, I think it's beautiful. Like I said, the work's beautiful. The photography's beautiful. It's just very cool to see people that really want to have quality photography done. They pick a great mm -hmm. photographer that's shooting film. It's very cool. Uh, Jose, let's talk about your blog where people can see what you're up to. I know you have one workshop coming up here in 2010. I really want to talk about your book project. You've got a couple book things that are just rocking. Yeah, I'm really excited. This year, 2010 or 2010, whatever they're calling it these days, is going to be a very exciting year. 2009, I'm really happy it's over. It was definitely a rough year in the economy, and there was definitely a lot of negotiation going on in my business. But I'm very open to everything. I love shooting, so I'm open to whatever comes my way. But 2010, man, it's pretty much rocking. And of course, that's just on the photography end of it, but also even in the industry for me, I'm excited because Random House has picked me up. They offered me this book deal. And it just sort of landed on my lap. I was very excited about it. was never in a million years thinking of doing a wedding book. My priority in doing a book has always been a Holga book or an alternative process book, more of landscapes and also mainly of documentary stuff that I've done in other countries, and mostly that's Mexico. But when Random House knocked on my door and said, hey, we have this idea, we want to do a fine art wedding book with you, I said, oh my gosh, are you kidding? Absolutely, let's do it. So contracts are signed. I have a ghost writer who's working on these chapters for me. We talk two days, three days a week for an hour each day, and we're hammering it through. So we're expecting that this book come out if all goes well, and it comes out in July or August of 2010. Also, I'm working on self-publishing a smaller coffee table book of my documentary stuff that I've shot in all Holga for Mexico. So I've been kind of researching printing and different countries that print books and different pricing and all that good stuff. So it's been interesting to kind of sort of see it in that way, too, because I've always been on this part of it, not necessarily on the publishing part of it. But I've learned a lot, and it's been a good experience. As far as my workshops go, I have one workshop that I'm working on. It's the annual workshop I do in Mexico. And this year will be the fourth year that we've had this workshop. Absolutely love it. It's definitely my favorite workshop I've ever done. It's going to be for a limited amount of people. And we have Jill LaFleur, who's a wedding planner here, to a lot of celebrities and also one of the biggest wedding planners here in California, and also Abby Larson, who owns Style Me Pretty, the blog that I talked about earlier in our conversation. I have these two wedding leaders in the industry come to really sort of share their experiences and also to really sort of open the eyes of these photographers that really need to expand and grow their business. So I have them there for the business part of it, and then I'm excited because I get to talk a lot about the art part of it and composition and film shooting which is really great. So it's a good combination to have. So I'm super excited. That's in November. We haven't released the dates quite yet, but you can find that information on joseviaworkshops.com. And I, of course, also have a blog, and that is joseviablog.com, where you can also find more information or keep up with me. No, this is great stuff you're doing, and I do appreciate you joining us. And I know that one more thing here, of course, you're going to be at WPPI speaking. Your class is already sold out but you'll be around the trade show and I think just hanging out for a few days. So there's another place. Yeah. If people want to week in and see what you're up to, they can find you in fabulous Las Vegas coming up here. Yeah, absolutely. And if not, that book hopefully comes out later on this year and you can definitely pick that up and find out a little bit more information because we definitely hammer in the details on lighting, natural light and artificial light, along with any technical information that you'll ever need, along with some really great photos up to about 190, 200 photos in the book. So I'm excited pictures that people haven't seen, pictures I haven't put on my blog or anything like that. So I'm excited. No, it's great. And it's great to see that Random House is actually getting into some of this photography and technology to showcase your work, but you're actually helping people do great photography too and how you're setting up some of these shots and saying how they were done with this lighting and that. 
I think it's going to be really helpful for people, especially people that want to transcend into going with film or going back to film and maybe acknowledging that they made a mistake when they went digital <laughs> and they want to go back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, overall, I'm excited. So it should be a really good experience. I've had a good experience so far. Right now, we are on Chapter 4. So we have seven chapters to go. Lots of work, and that's partly why I'm not doing as many workshops this year, is because I'm focusing on that aspect of it so much more. And also, of course, my priority are my clients that I've booked so far and that I will continue to book. But on the side part of it, because I shoot film, it allows me to work on some fun projects, and those fun projects are my books. So I'm excited. Well, I think that's the thing. And with shooting as much as you do and all these great places you get to go, you need to work on personal projects, too, that I think a lot of photographers forget about. You need to do personal things besides work. Absolutely. I just Twittered a week ago. Photographers, do not ever stop shooting for yourself. And I got a lot of response off of that. I think people were at the end of the year going, oh, he's right. Oh, my gosh. Almost like a little eye opener. And it was retwittered like a billion times because everyone gets so much into what they're doing. Weddings, 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 post-production or workflow or whatever it is, contracts, meetings, that we forget that really we should definitely continue to shoot for ourselves because that really is the inspiration that keeps us going. No, it is. And then I really appreciate you joining us on the program today, Jose. Again, beautiful photography, great work, and just really cool things you're up to. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I look forward to seeing you soon, Scott. Well, there you go. Jose Villa, what a cool guy. Great, beautiful work. And you can stay tuned for more information. Jose is going to be doing a report for us coming up here, Imaging USA, that was in Nashville. So we can look forward to Jose coming back on the program, giving us a report on what was there at Imaging USA. This is a professional photographer of America's annual show this year in Nashville, Tennessee, to talk about what was there for the analog photographer. The Inside Analog Photography radio program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. DR5 over at www.dr5.com. Iger Studios over at igerstudios.com. Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. And, of course, our media partners, APUG, the Analog Photography User Group, over at www.apug.org. Our photography, philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.geh.org. I've been your host, Scott Chipper, here on Inside Analog Photography Radio. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.